first up is uh, the Venerable Rabina Curtin. Uh, now, Venerable Rabina, or Ven Rob, as she's called, a little bit like J-Lo, I think we should all start calling her Ven Rob. Um, Ven Rabina was ordained, ordained as a Tibetan Buddhist nun in 1977. Uh, she was the editorial director of, the, of Wisdom Publications until 1987 and then editor of the international Buddhist magazine Mandala until the end of 2000. In 1997, she founded the Liberation Prison Project, which works with people in prison throughout the US, helping them with their Buddhist practice and studies. Pretty amazing. She's an incredible teacher. Her teachings are unrelenti unrelentingly challenging, hard-hitting, serious, funny, visceral, inspiring and empowering, but you'll see that for yourself. Ven Rabina specialises in applying the wisdom of Tibetan Buddhism into contemporary life, um, using examples from TV, magazines and film. She has taught meditations to prisoners all over the world, and if you don't think that is difficult enough, she's also had to work with Judith Lucy on her show on the ABC called Spiritual Journey. So, um, from prisoners to Judas, um, developing, and she developed a particularly close connection with people uh, we, it, having, who were undergoing life sentences in the USA. She's also the subject of an award-winning Australian documentary called Chasing Buddha. Now, to present working with disturbing emotions in everyday life, and that is not just about her having to sit next to me during lunch, please put your hands together and welcome a woman who was once uh, mistaken for Ronnie Corbett in the back of a cab in London. True story, Ven Rob, Venerable Rabina Curtin. Uh, disturbing emotions, that's the topic, I think, working with them. Well, I should give you some context, I think. And the, the context here is Buddha's view of the mind, his model of the mind, you know, and really, not joking, saying, but really Buddha is, a, he's, he, his, his expertise is the mind. He didn't use the word psychology back then because he didn't speak Greek, you know, but his deal is the mind. That's what he deals with. But he's got a lot of very different views from the people this morning. Maybe it comes down to the same thing, but he, you know, you ask a, a meditator where their brain is, they wouldn't have a clue. And they don't study the brain, they don't, they don't know those things, but they study their mind, you know, and that's this, the cognitive processes themselves. And maybe that's what you're doing as a Buddhist. And the expertise of the Buddha, like, you know, these techniques, some of these techniques, they're called meditation, but they're just brilliant, marvelous, sophisticated psychological techniques that have been around well and truly before the Buddha. He took them from the Hindus, you know. They're happy to share, they don't mind. But because we have so many cliched ideas in our culture, as soon as we hear the word meditation, you know, we lose the plot, we get all mystical and strange. But actually they're really rigorous, disciplined, marvelous, sophisticated techniques that enable a person to know their own mind, you know. So one of my teachers, Lama Yeshi, he says we need to be our own therapist, we need to be our own psychologist, and that's not a joke. And I think that's the essence. If you're doing this and you're on track working with Buddha's approach to life, you know. So you get it right, get, if you get past all the religious thing, like I'm a nun, you know, get past all this. And this is, I think, a bit of a surprise to us because we're so used to seeing the religious packaging, we don't notice it's the mind. Then we hear the word meditation. And if we hear spiritual, we think soul, we think spirit, and we think it's something mysterious. But that's not the Buddhist approach. Because, you know, so for the, the, the mind for the Buddha, like I said, is, is the cognitive process but it goes to much deeper levels. We've got the intellectual, we have the emotional, the feelings, un unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition. The word mind in Buddhism, used synonymously with the word consciousness, covers all of this. And so that, like I said, that's, that's the stuff that we're trying to become familiar with. And why would we want to become familiar with it? Because it runs the show. As far as the Buddha's concerned, we're not made by someone else. We're not plonked on this earth, you know, which was all what we think. I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault. Well, Buddha says it is. We create the cause to be who we are and we come programmed with our stuff, you know? And so our job, the onus is on us to know our own minds deeply and well because that runs the show. So if you think about it, we have body and we have speech, you know, which we give a lot of power to, but for the Buddha, they're just the servants of the mind. They're the servants of the thoughts and feelings and emotions. So, so this is also where in Buddhism, this is where it sounds a bit like religion, morality and ethics comes into it. But it's a very basic thing and this is a basis in Buddhist practice. The basis of morality in Buddhism is not, nothing coming from on high, but it's the simple, you know, conventional thing that you can prove that an, an action that isn't good is one that harms another. And an action that's called good is one that benefits another. It's pretty reasonable. You know, you do your market research in this room, and we can all agree 100%, we don't want to be killed, we don't want to be bad-mouthed, we don't want to be kicked in the teeth, we don't want to have our things stolen, and you look at the dogs and the, and the, the mice, they're the same. So 
so uh, you know, uh, taking care of others and not harming them is the basis. So then, on, so if that's so, and, and this is what causes happiness, Buddha says. We all want happiness, which is this, um, and we don't want suffering. So taking this as our basis, then what would we do? What's the action from this? Well, we have to look into the mind. The very first level of practice, actually, junior school level, is you control your body and speech. You behave nicely. You zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. You do what your grandma told you. You behave well. And then on the basis, then having done this, you can begin to go to kind of high school where you now can start to look into your mind, developing these psychological techniques and observing the mind. So what's in there? What's Buddha's deal? What's his model? Well, it's really simple, actually. Deceptively simple. Embarrassingly simple. But don't, don't underestimate it. Buddha's view, it says, if we look into our mind, we're going to find three categories of states of mind. We're going to find those that are positive, those that are negative, and those that are neutral. Well, forget the neutral, they're neither here nor there. Our business is the positive and the negative. But right at the beginning, the business is to identify the negative ones or the disturbing emotions. This is one of the many synonyms for negative state of mind. These are the ones, the Buddha says, that cause us, cause us suffering. The extent to which I have them is the extent to which I suffer. So don't think of it in a moralistic sense, like you shouldn't feel bad, you shouldn't be angry because someone said so. The Buddha's first point is that we can start looking into our minds and recognize these disturbing emotions, and they're hardly rocket science. We all know the words, anger, fear, low self-esteem, jealousy, depression, anxiety. We've all got them. He says that what we have to learn to see, first identify them, and then see that that's why I suffer. So it's almost like you've got to cultivate some compassion for yourself first. And then the action from this, if I can see that I don't, I don't want to be miserable, I don't like the experience, I don't like the heartbreaking experience of jealousy and anger and depression, which I think we can agree, he says, okay, what can you do about that? Well, our problem in our world is because our philosophy says that I've got, I'm jealous because he did that and I'm angry because she said that, then naturally the action would be to do something to the people out there. Because as far as we're concerned, they're the main cause of our problem. Buddha says, sure, Fred punched you in the nose, not cool. But that's his problem. Yours is the anger. And so what all Buddha does is he doesn't deny the external. He simply factors in the internal. And he says if we can have the power, we, we have the power to know our own mind, to identify the, the negative emotion that rises in response to the external conditions of this world, and if we change those, he calls that liberation. Liberation, which means nirvana, is not some sexy, you know, not some place where you have to go to to give up having given up sex, drugs, and rock and roll of samsara. Nirvana is a word, really speaking simply, that refers to the mind of the person who's done this job that Buddha says we can do, of identifying what's there, identifying the emotional, the negative ones, unpacking them, unraveling them, deconstructing them, and actually, actually changing the actual cognitive process that, that go on inside, that are at the basis of these emotions. And that's what you're doing as a Buddhist. And if you're not doing that, you're not a Buddhist. If you're walking around a bunch of robes with a bald head, looking holy and being mindful, that's not being Buddhist. As Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. It's hardly holy, you know? So being your own therapist, taking responsibility, knowing your own mind, and having this, this confident view that, yes, there is anger and depression and jealousy and low self-esteem, and it does paralyze me, but hey, you know what? It doesn't define me. It isn't who I really am, and I can change it. This is the basis, you know? So to have that kind of confidence. And then, of course, that, brings, that, that means we need to have the courage to want to look inside. In these meditation techniques that they teach, which have come from thousands of years ago, this simple type of technique called concentration meditation, this marvelous, as I said, sophisticated psychological tool, you know, one of the first, the first, one of the first signs of success in learning to develop these introspective techniques is you think you're getting worse. And then we freak out, you know? But it's like when you go to the gym and you decide you know, you're a bit fat and floppy and you want to start looking like Arnie Schwarzenegger. So you go to the gym. Well, believe me, you don't feel good on the first day. You think you're getting worse. You've discovered muscles you, never had, you thought you never had before, but you know it's a good sign. So we're not getting worse when we look into our mind. It's only because we've never looked into it before. It's not part of our education. And I don't mean the brain. I mean the actual processes themselves, the actual thoughts and feelings and emotions, which is an interesting way to think about it. To look into the way the mind works itself, it's kind of scary. Because everything in us wants to either live in denial of it, to feel guilty about it, which is really neurotic, or to blame everybody else. So this process is a one of accountability, having the courage to look into the cancer, to look into it and to look at the mess that this crazy stuff is. Because if you want to change it, you have to identify it. 
you know, you can't just be superficial in, in, in saying, oh, there's a cancer, oh, I don't want to look at it. You've got to identify it with your microscope and know its exact tech, nature so you can then find the antidote. Well, this is the job, and it's the toughest job we'll ever do. Who wants to look into their depression? Who wants to look into their fear? But this is the job. But it's a particularly interesting approach because, you know, because the, the, the basis of our, most of our models of the mind in our culture are that it's, it's physical, brain, genes, whatever, although indeed this morning, talking about you know, conditions, clearly. When you go to your therapist, usually, you know, what we have to do, what we need to do is look back into the conditions of our life, because that's the philosophy we have. We believe we're made by our parents. You know, so we look back into what the parents did, we look into the past, and we look into the external events. But this, this approach that Buddha's got, and pre, here it is a distinct difference, and it's extremely tasty. You're looking into the thoughts themselves. So when I go to my therapist and what's your problem? It's anger, well, you know, daddy did this and mummy did this and the partner did this. This is helpful, it's good to know the conditions. But to actually learn to have techniques that enable you to look into the actual process of the anger, first the emotional level and then the cognitive level beneath it, the bare bones of the emotion. The get down to the way you see it's a series of elaborate thoughts. It's a very vivid and very powerful story that you believe absolutely is the truth. So to have the courage to go into that and unpack pack it and learn to see how it isn't always true and then learn to see how you can actually change it. That's the point. It's scary, but it's the most tasty job we'll ever do. And it's the most courageous because we're not trying to push it away or blame everybody else or live in denial or have guilt. Guilt and blame are identical. The difference is the object, you know. You did this and you did this and you're a bad person. Or it's I did this and I did that and I'm a bad person. I remember Martin Luther King even saying one time, it's okay to be angry, it's okay to find fault, but then you say, what can I do about it? It's the same with your own mind. You need to see what's in there, but then you just don't beat yourself up. That's useless, it's impotent. We then say, what can I do about it? Well, the Buddha says you can change it. We're discovering, you know, we're, they're calling it neuroplasticity, and somebody last century said it was the greatest finding of the 20th century. Well, I'm happy we're catching up with the Buddha. He told us this two and a half thousand years ago, you know? I'm very happy we're catching up with him. We can change. We're not stuck with what we've got. And that's the basis of this approach to the mind, you know? So, okay, what is it? So, what is a disturbing emotion and why is it disturbing? What is it about it? And how is it different from a so called positive one? I mean, these words kind of sound almost cute positive, negative, you know? Well, the Buddha's view of a positive state of mind, and let's take a couple of examples. We all know them, we're in agreement. They're called love, empathy, compassion, wisdom, joy, contentment these words, forgiveness. And the negative, and we know, you check yourself in your own experience. The extent to which you have any one of those prevalent at any given moment in your mind, you check, is the extent to which you're feeling okay, reasonable, connected to others, harmonious, courageous, peaceful, happy. Then check the other ones, we all know them. Anger, like I said, fear, depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, panic. Check how you feel, it's like hell. So it's clear they are disturbing. It's not a, it's not a moral judgment, it's, it's, it's a practical fact, you know. But the trouble is, we can hear this easily enough and we can see it, but the problem is, you know, it's like if you learn botany, you, 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 you get the weed and you can draw it and you can identify it, you get the flower or the herb and you can see how they're distinctly different in separate drawings. But when you look into that big mass of overgrown green stuff out there and they're all mixed together, it's hard to identify them because they look all mixed up. This is the trouble with our mind. So we need to define what a negative emotion is and look at its characteristics. This is the Buddhist approach, be very precise. In fact, the precision and clarity and depth of analysis that we know we need in the work that the people here are doing, the scientists, is the exact same precision and clarity and depth of analysis that Buddha demands we use in this in, in, you know, in identification of our own mind, the thoughts and feelings. So it's not just some wishy-washy mystical thing where you close your eyes and hope for the best, which is how we think of it. Then we're gonna see the negative states and we, we see, look into the mind, we're going to identify the negative ones, and they've got two distinct characteristics. The first one, and it's indicated by that term, disturbing emotion. Check it out, not hard to prove, it's disturbing for me. It's like hell. That should be enough for us to never want to have it again. The second one, though, is really tasty, you know? Is someone going to tell me the time here, or do I have to be clairvoyant and know when it's 2.30? <laughs> God. It'll come when I'm ready. Okay, thank you. It just says mind and its potential right now. Okay, I have 10 minutes to go. 
So a negative state, this other characteristic, which is really tasty, there's a term in Buddhist psychology, in Tibetan language, and coming from the, from the uh, what's the one? Sanskrit. It's called delusion. This is synonymous with negative. This is surprising. If you're accused of being delusional, you'd be very offended. But 10 minutes to go. But this is what Buddha's telling us. He says these unhappy emotions have this interesting characteristic of causing us to be delusional. Big surprise. So what does this mean? Simple, you're out of sync with reality. So even, you know, this, this is one that Buddha talks about called attachment, which is like the default mode, a cute word, but a profound impact in our mind, deep in the bones of our being, that comes from this deep sense of dissatisfaction that then causes us to hanker after things, causes us to manipulate to get them, and then causes us to grasp after them, and like the chocolate cake, and put it in the mouth and then wait for happiness to come. You know, this is the process that we live according to every day. This, 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 this uh, attachment being one of these delusions and a disturbing emotion, you look how it causes the cake to look. Now, we think the chocolate cake is delicious out there from its own side. We think it's kind of like vibrating deliciousness and I'm just sitting here, poor victim me, what can I do? I'm, it's begging me to eat it. It's not my fault, you know? That's how we think. But in reality, Buddha says, our mind, in particular, the particular state of mind called attachment, which is deep in our bones, is making up this insanely ridiculous story about the cake that just isn't true. It's del we're delusional. There's a neediness there, there's a sense that I'm not enough, which is also not true, Buddha says, because we are enough. We, we should be blissful with who we are, but we think we're not enough. We think we don't have enough, so we hanker. Then you're looking for something out there, and then you, and you grab the chocolate cake, and then instantaneously this story arises. You know, the cake that we see is this divine, delicious chocolate cake that when I eat it, it'll make me happy. That's the cake we see. Well, the Buddha's saying that cake doesn't exist. It's a fantasy. You've got your rose-colored spectacles on. And then that's the thing you expect when you put it in the mouth. So that's delusional. When you're in love with somebody, they look like they're God incarnate, don't they? They tip of their toe down to their smelly toenails. They look divine. Six months later, or less than that usually, have a look at them now. <laughs> you can't believe. But he hasn't changed. He hasn't even got much fatter. There's no more gray hair. What's changed is your mind. The attachment has died down, and now it's taken place by aversion. You look at him in the bed, you can't believe this person next to you. <laughs> What's changed is your mind. The story in the mind has changed. We know this, but we do, kind of, it's embarrassing to admit it. But we're convinced he has changed. If only I knew what he was like six months ago. He was always the same, you just couldn't see him because you were blinded by your dazzling view. Your mind made up a story. Well, if that's not delusional, I don't know what is, you know. So the Buddha's deal very much, talking this morning about truth, that's Buddha's thing finding out what's real and what's not. And the method for doing this is identifying these neuroses which happen to cause us suffering and which happen to be liars, happen to be delusional. So sorting them out and then removing them from one's mind. Because Buddha's very interesting, you know. If I go to my therapist and I say to them, would you, would you please give me methods to get rid of all ego, all jealousy, all depression, all anger, all attachment, all fears, and have love and compassion for all living beings, they will think I'm a psychotic person and give me a pill and lock me up. But this is exactly, actually, what Buddha's saying. Don't mystify it. This is his, this is his point. It's what he means by these words, liberation. You know? Don't think it as religion. It's a, it's a psychological, doable state that Buddha says, just naturally, everyone has the potential to accomplish. This is what he's saying, you know? So, and that state is what? Well, keep it simple. The goodness in us, the love and compassion and wisdom and harmony and this stuff and intelligence and joy and creativity, all the things we're talking about, these are, the Buddha says, at the core of our being. They're not wishy-washy things. When, you know, so when you, the more attachment and fears and jealousy and anger you have, the more small you are, the more cut off you are, the more bereft and lonely and freaked out, and therefore the more needy and manipulative and harmful to others. And then the, as you get rid of these, it's like you're literally expanding your own mind. And, cultivating the stuff that's already there. The goodness is coming to the fore. As you remove the pollution from the water, the water's already there. The H2O is there. You're just allowing it to come to the surface. This is the Buddhist approach. So the goodness is there. It's at the core of our being, the Buddha says. So by, re by focusing on the pollution, initially, focusing on the delusions and neuroses, identifying them with courage and clarity, and gradually changing them at a cognitive level beneath the emotions, this is how we change. If this is, and this is a doable, practical, ongoing, progressive job. Takes time, don't hold your breath, you know. It's something practical, this is the Buddhist approach, you know.
Six minutes. Ask some questions. <laughs> I've said enough. I talk faster than everybody else. <laughs> no, not really. Everybody this morning talked really fast. It was good, except for Dr. DeBono. He talked nice and slow. So do you have any questions? Anything? Questions? I know you didn't prepare for questions, but it's all right. Yes, darling. Go. Sweetheart, what's your question? That's right. What, darling? They have a purpose. What do you mean they have a purpose? To make you miserable, yeah, that's a great purpose. <laughs> of course, if you break your leg, that will teach you not to break your leg again. But what a wonderful lesson to never have to break your leg again. <laughs> given that we do have, I get your point, given that we do, <laughs> given that we do have fear and anxiety, they, we can learn to work with them. Absolutely, honey. There's no question. We can use them as grist for the mill. But the goal is to go beyond them. How marvelous to not have to have fear. How marvelous, you know, obstacles on your road are a really good thing. But how marvelous to have a road that doesn't have an obstacle. The, the, po the essential point here is, given that we do have them, what do we do with them? Yes, recognize them, see how they cause pain. Then have the courage to work with them and learn to use them, eventually to conquer them, to go beyond them. That's the point. And that's up to you. You might, you might prefer to keep them. Do you see my point, though? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you. If we're working with children, at what point and what age and how might an educator develop the mind and its potential? I'll tell you. I understand. With all of this? Absolutely. Let's keep the mic. Keep the mic. Let's say your question was, how do I teach children piano? What would your uh, first answer be? You'd have to have a piano teacher and expert you, No, teacher. no. You, the question is, how will I help That's children right. play piano? What do I have to do? Mm. I have to know how to play. That's right. So the extent to which you know your mind is only the extent to which you can help another. So that's, there's, no, there's no other answer. And we don't have that view in our culture because we think we've got to look in the brain to know the mind. But you have to learn to be introspective. You have to know your anger, your fears, your jealousy, your potential, your love, your compassion. Then you are perfectly qualified to see the mind of that child. And if you haven't looked at yourself, you cannot help the child. That's a fact. I understand that. I guess I'm hopeful that we might impart some of that wisdom to what, darling? a more general educational system rather than individual children that we might work with. Yeah, well, then we have to have teachers who've done the same thing. My point is that we have to learn it ourselves. There's no shortcut. You understand? I do. Yeah. Yes, one more. Three minutes to go. <laughs> yes, talk. A oh, sweetheart here. Oh, sorry, you missed out. I'm sorry, darling. Yes, talk to me. Okay, um, when you're talking about positivity being at the core of our being, the, the, yep. the point I just realised there is that to focus on the good things is a conscious choice and that we, we heard earlier that the negativity bias is automatic, it's innate. So to be positive, we have to forge a conscious So what's practice. the question? So <laughs> my question is... Yeah. How do we encourage the conscious practice of positivity versus the... Well, if you're playing the... If you learn to first play the piano, you can't play it, can you? How do you learn to, to be positive? It means to play the right notes. You have to learn the techniques. The same with your mind. It's exactly the same. You learn to know what the mind is. You learn to know what a negative one is, what a positive one is. You observe what's more prevalent within you using these introspective techniques, and then you practice lessening the negative thoughts and growing the positive ones. Then you end up being like Mozart. It's the same. You it's the same. So simple. It is What's simple. The first step? It is simple. What's the first step? The first step is no, you can do it. Okay. <laughs> Have confidence. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, over here. One more. Two minutes. <laughs> I understood. That, I understand that the Buddha in his cultural background. He what, darling? Well, I understand that the Buddha himself didn't know what to do with women. Oh, rubbish, of course he did. Look, I'm here. I'm the proof. <laughs> not true. You're a lot later than... He, you're not as old as him, right? In his day, he didn't know what to do. He did. He but had his mother end, and his sister. All the girls yeah, became nuns end, as well. You figured out, figured it's okay. Out. It's space is. and time, darling. It's just India. That's how it was, you know? It's okay. And all the girls have been boys' countless lives, and the boys have all been girls' countless lives. So, you know, that's the way it is. Join the club. Time to finish. Thank you very much. But no, I've got one minute.
Ben Rabina okay. Curtain. I've got to sing a prayer. I want to sing a prayer. But don't get holy just because it's called a prayer. It's going to be in Tibetan and singing. And it's a little prayer that's basically saying, here we have been for 30 minutes, all these things. We've forgotten 90% of it. It's okay, but they've all gone in. We've programmed our mind with it. So may these grow and we cultivate our own potential and never give up for our sake and the sake of others. And I'll just sing it in Tibetan. Can I do? Session over. Bad luck. Gewa di nyudu dag Lama sangge drub gyur ne Drowa chi kyang ma lupa Te yi sa la ke pa Okay. Thank you.